Hello, my lovely. Um, to all my lovely listeners, we're here with Claire Morley Jones, oh, the MD Chief People Person at HR 180. <laughs> Give her a new title. And um, Lisa Clifford and Lexi the dog, who yes. will not be left out. No, she was determined to join us. And we're very warmed up because we've just had a cup of tea for an hour and a half and put the world to rights. So maybe the, maybe we should have had record on then. Yes. Yes. <laughs> no, we wouldn't have to do that. That would have been very entertaining. So, I'm not sure everybody would have wanted to join in that conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this podcast is titled Meant for More, and it's about the Meant for More movement, helping empower millions of people um, to live the life they feel they were meant for. And I want to open up with that question for you, that vast big question when did you first or when did you have an experience where you knew you were meant for more and it changed your life mm. you know, I was meant for more and it's changed my life um I don't know is that really what I'm giving you're like why are you on this podcast if you don't know <laughs> led to up to it. I'm not sure I ever ever had that massive epiphany of like I meant for more. I don't know. But I think there were lots of little steps that led up to it all the way through my life that then ultimately culminated in me going, I don't have to do this anymore. I can do that. Does that make sense? Mm. So I'm not sure that there was a one moment where lightning struck and um and I went, oh I think it was lo- lots of things as I said. So um, I had an um, amazing friend who I was talking to about starting a business. So she's like, just do it. You can do it. And when we talked about the things, those little steps, they made sense. You know, people, uh, even though I had no power in, in, in a, you know, I had like I didn't have a job title maybe, or every, people would still come to me and say, what should we do? <laughs> what were you doing? So take us back to what your job was and where you were at and... And um, when it was at. Uh, yeah, okay. So um, I had been at that point with O2 for a little while, about 18 months, I think. Um, and the project that I was working on was, was literally just coming to an end. But I had, uh, prior to that, I had been in uh, various law firms. I've always been in HR, um, but I'd worked for Shoesmith and Eversheds. I'd had a stint working with St John's Ambulance with a, a charity fundraiser as well. Um, and it didn't matter what job I, even, even at school, mm. so I was a prefect mm-hmm. at school, yeah. What a surprise. Uh, you want a surprise. Uh, librarian. Um, I'd always taken on lots of, uh, lots of positions of responsibility and people trusted me to do that. Mm. Um, and then um, the kids now have something called pupil voice, where there's a student that's responsible for filtering information from all the students up to the school in ideas and suggestions and I, that's how I was then I mean we didn't call it that but people would come and moan at me essentially <laughs> and I'd have to find a way of taking that information and uh, giving it to somebody who actually could make a difference or, or make the changes that, that people were, were wanting um, and so yes I always had positions of responsibility, always had people who look to me to help them, I, I always have wanted to help um, and I think that also gave me the impetus to start HR 180 because I wanted to be able to support more people than mm-hmm. I was able to in my corporate job. Mm-hmm. Um, And so it's all these little things, it's people trusting me, it's people looking to me for answers, um, it's not, it's being unflappable, Mm. Um, I'm not one for big drama, Uh, I also have a really high tolerance for pressure, I quite like pressure, it helps me to achieve, Um, and and so all of those things lead to you then thinking, actually I think I probably could run my own business Mm. if I'm good at this, and I've always got lots of ideas. Um, I think obviously working in business isn't only about ideas and there's lots of ideas I've had that you don't do anything with because there's not enough time or actually they're not going to add any value to anyone. Um, But I think all those things culminated in sitting down for a meal with a really good friend of mine and her saying you can you can do this and me thinking well actually yeah I probably can and then that's when I started HR 180 when I was 28. 
Ooh, that's a long time ago. A couple of years ago. <laughs> a couple of years. Thank you. Yeah. That's why I've been friends for so long. Yes. And why my children are going to be 11 next Unbelievable. week. Unbelievable. <laughs> and what can you do now with your own business that's a, part, a big part of who you are that you couldn't have done when you were employed? <laughs> what I want. <laughs> yeah. What I want. Um... I, I don't wish to uh, speak ill of former employers, but at the end of the day, you are governed by what the business actually wants and, and um, limited, actually, by sometimes what the business wants um, or what it's commercially available, uh, you know, the, the opportunities that you have to actually achieve it are limited. Whereas um, in running my own business, one of the very first things, people were paying me for my expertise, so they listened mm. and, um, and implemented and did. Um, and, then, uh, and then the business grew and they asked us whether we could develop services that would meet that requirement, which we've done, mm. um, and that's helped us to grow. So we've been able to, to take on um, being... In, so, for example, we started as a consultancy, so I just went in and um, told people what they needed to do and help to implement it initially but not to properly necessarily bed in or maintain it for the long term and clients said to us well how do we keep this going for the long term um, and that's how the outsourced HR uh, mm -hmm. side of our business the full service agency came about rather than just being a consultancy mm -hmm. um, and so yeah you can you're limited a bit by the culture you're limited a bit by the what the executive team so actually so wants to achieve sorry to interrupt you a little bit there but i just love that your business the products and services that you offer in your business have been the demands of your clients that have needed it rather than yeah. you starting off with right what have i got to sell and who can i sell it to <laughs> <laughs> it's been yeah. more um you've created and crafted the business around clients requests and needs and yeah. um desires and now it's become tried and tested and now is your business yeah i mean the whole payroll team definitely is we would never have done payroll that i have never done payroll ever in my entire career i've managed to avoid i've been responsible for payroll team mm. but i'd managed to avoid payroll my yeah. whole whole career yeah. Um, and then we had a client who was really unhappy, I shan't mention who they were unhappy with, but deeply unhappy with a very big provider, and said, you know, we trust you, we know that it will be really good if you, if, and, and you know, everything will be right every month, whereas at the moment everything's wrong, can you put together a payroll team? And um, Isabel, who uh, is, despite mm. the trauma of putting a payroll team together, is still with me today. <laughs> Um, and coming up for 15 years oh. service in a few days time um, she put together and built and, and researched all the software and, and implemented all the software that meant that we could run a payroll team within three months for this particular client and then payroll services obviously have kind of grown from there and we've still got clients that use it. I think the key though is in something that you just said which is um, clients trusted you even though you weren't known for payroll you had to find a way of doing it yeah learn it bed it in test and measure it all yeah. on them but yeah. they'd rather have had you make you making mistakes on them than their current yeah. provider making mistakes on them and i think that's when when i think about so let's just settle down now <laughs> I've been holding my breath seeing you in black and, and <laughs> white gold hair. I love. So for job those, I'm used to. those of you that don't know me, I have a white golden retriever and um, Claire is here in a beautiful black jumpsuit that will soon no longer resemble black by the time she leaves. And my golden retriever could not possibly be in the room whilst Claire says she loves Claire. Um, so just uh, what I know and love about you is your huge personality. <laughs> Claire was holding her breath for a moment there. Um, I was what, what was coming out <laughs> what there? What secrets <laughs> coming out of that box? But your huge personality and um, in all my years that I've known you, and we were working this out earlier, well you said it's 18 when I yeah. believe you. I've got a menopausal brain at the moment so if you say my name's Fred and we've known each other 18 years, then yeah, eighteen I'm years. Is there must be something like that. Yeah, yeah. seventeen, eighteen. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that whole time, 
you are somebody that I could say, help, and you would get in your car or make me get in mine <laughs> and be there. We have done things from... Vice versa. When, I, when I never had a website 18 years I ago. I know. We went to, when you oh, were working out of your back bedroom, your amazing empire that you've got now that you would never call an empire, <laughs> but that you've got this gorgeous suite of offices that are absolutely stunning, that they're luxurious, a happy team. Um, but back in the day, you started the way a lot of businesses start, but don't know if they'll be able to make it. So I think your story is so inspiring in your back bedroom. But I remember being in your back bedroom and you say, oh, I've been working with some uh, a PR agent and the uh, journalist wants in the website, but I haven't got one, but I actually don't need one because I've got loads of business. So you sat with me and wrote it. You created it and wrote it, wrote, wrote it, wrote it in an evening. Another time, um, I needed, back in the day, in 2008, I was going to be doing the re I trained to be a fire walking and empowerment instructor, and one of the things I didn't do with people is do a rebar bend, reinforcement bars that strengthen concrete, but I needed to practice the demonstration of it. <laughs> oh! <laughs> You turned up yeah. in your work clothes, yeah, and we were in my kitchen yeah. practicing it until you said, "No, please, is it okay if we stop now after about two hours?" Yeah. Um, oh, the list is endless. How amazing! I, I'll never forget the first session that I did with you where you did the the um, arrow break and the rebar and the and the fire walk, and I was just supporting you just for the day as as a you know some somebody that could be there. Um, and it was just absolutely I think that amazing. was with, uh, was that when we went to a hotel? It was a hotel, yeah. yes, that it was. That was with Pork Farms and Deborah Bolton, who's a, an amazing friend of mine now, and a trained fire walking instructor. Right. Still, uh, but yeah. It was absolutely phenomenal. The power in that room and the people that cried because they were released, felt released from something. Um, and just had, and then, but then they were released initially. It was really weird. They were they were released initially. Um, people were nervous to start with. Then they worked through, obviously, and they did the arrow break and felt like they'd been released for something. And then completely empowered through the the power walk, uh, through the fire walk, and leaving at the end of the session, buoyed and I just I can't just, yes, I cannot describe the energy after. And obviously, I've done. Lots of Loads, since then, yes. I? yeah. But that very first one, it will always stay with me for the um, energy that was mm. in that room and the power of those individuals to when they see um, their own potential. It's yes, like, exactly. Yeah, that's what the tears come from as well. Is oh my goodness, that can I really? I have done that. Can I really do it? Yeah. But you also take me back to the time that we went to a client of yours. That completely trusted you because this is what <laughs> this is what where I'm getting to <laughs> with the fact that people I trust you, but you show with your personality, your warmth, your expertise, and your willingness to say, right, I'm in. What am I in? But I'm in. I'm in. But you took me and we did some work with a company of that you yes, were working I think with. I know which story you're going to go with. And is this where they signed the waiver? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so I got everybody to sign the waiver because of course I got to sign the waiver. Yeah, it's dangerous, dangerous. Yeah. highly possible, um, and very empowering activity. But it is also dangerous, which what yeah. makes people think oh, I'm going to pay attention. I'm really going to give this everything I've got. Yeah, and um, and this was when breaking arrows with your throat and bending rebars and fire walking was not widely out yeah, there. Yeah, very new. Um, and yeah. it was really brave for anybody to take it into a company. And you took me into this company. I said, right, before we do anything, we're going to break an arrow with our throat. Um, but I'd like you to sign this disclaimer first. I think we signed the disclaimers that were very good because they trusted Claire um, and therefore trusted me. And um, signed the disclaimers and I came to demonstrate it. And one gorgeous young lady said, oh, thank God for that. It's on your throat. I thought you'd put it in your mouth and down your throat and snapped it. 
And, and I said, oh my, I will never forget this for the rest of my life. You oh, still yeah, sign the disclaimer, she did. thinking that was the method. Yeah. But the point of that story and everything else I've said is about the trust that people can trust themselves to have in you and your team and how you show up for them. And I think that's nice. Um, I'm going to cry. I don't, yeah, do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's why somebody would say to you, I know you don't do payroll, but can you? And you can you and I'm so, and I'm also you know in between the lines happy for you to make for you to make mistakes on those, but I'm not happy for another company to make mistakes. And I yeah. think whilst I I bet you didn't make any mistakes, yeah. and, none, and none that um, I think one I think I th the first one went swimmingly. I think the second one there was a mistake, and we were all distraught. Yeah. And from that, um, Isabel Creighton and others have. have done since then a payroll bible mm. so we have like a bible that explains exactly yeah but that one mistake almost killed us in terms of yeah being really but that's really how upset you that the client down. And, and the, but they but they were fully aware that there would be oh um, yeah of course i mean yeah. they were really happy it was only one mistake we were beside ourselves yeah <laughs> and you're a perfectionist yes which is actually good. doing the work that you do your clients will be very relieved about well that. yeah you'd hope yes yeah. <laughs> that you're the one well, that's awake not. at night on their yes, behalf on their of behalf. making yeah. sure that everything's done right yeah and so i imagine that the the because men for more is about people that um, know that what they're doing that they can actually achieve more it's not necessarily more volume but go for the things that scare them and but they would love and desire and and I bet that when you were employed the part that you maybe had to minimize was the you part mm, that, massively. and and the you part yeah. is is massive it's your it's also your unique selling point and your company is your personality and your values someone in the team found a picture of a corporate me <laughs> And, uh, I mean, obviously, it's a really long time ago now. I started HR 1 18 2006. Um, but because I was so young, but I had positions of responsibility, I needed to look older. And they were like, oh, my goodness. You're, I was in a suit. I mean, I don't remember the last time I wore a suit. Um, and, yeah, and I did, I did look much older. And they were like, you look older here when you were 15 years younger <laughs> than you do now. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. I was very pleased with but that. There is that mentioned. thing, though, isn't but there? There is a feeling like you have to work. convince yes. people that you're more mature yes. than you look. Oh, people told me that. Mm. People were like, you're too young to run a business. I had one person tell me that... Um, in one of my very first networking events, that there was absolutely no point me setting up. Um, I would be setting up in competition to him and I might as well just join him as an associate because he already had Yorkshire Market wrapped up and I just didn't stand a chance. Wow. Um, I've got to thank that man because... Where's he, he, where's he now? Oh, no, he's, he's still in business. Right, yeah. okay. And, I, but, and um, you didn't run him over? I didn't, no. 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 It took it's a legal. lot of self-control. <laughs> <laughs> Shock. I have to say, I was really, I was really in shock. But, but at the same time, I mean, thank you. I walked out of that room going, "I'll prove you wrong." Did you? <laughs> yes. Like yes. Motivation yeah. is somebody underestimating you, and then you, um, you think, mm, yeah, challenge accepted. Yes, yes, I've done. Yes, it does. I, yeah, I. Um, <laughs> one of my school reports once it said, um, "Claire is always very confident, uh, sometimes bordering on arrogance." <laughs> Which my parents obviously didn't take too well to, but yeah. I do. I think there's a level of that, and I'm not saying I don't have moments. Of course I do, where you you're worried about that push through and can I and do I mm. will I? Of course you have those moments, um, but at the same time, yes, I do like to show that I, I am capable of being able. I don't like being told I can't do something. Mm. I think actually. I don't know being told no, mm. and so therefore I'm going to do it. You rise. Yes, mm. yes, yeah. Mm. I do. And, and yet I say I'm not a competitive person. <laughs> well, you're you, 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 Yeah, you definitely want to be on your team, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. That's for sure, because you're always finding, what I know about you, you're always finding a solution, you're always looking at improving, you're always looking at bringing people mm. on board, yeah. and you're brilliant at knowing your flaws uh, well you're looking at me in a shop yeah no, I, I, have I, 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 I haven't personally, personally I do, seen I do any have flaws. 
Yeah. I know you've got one in the kitchen and <laughs> the bathroom. I've seen those. Yeah, but you're good because you recruit around them, don't yes. you? You know you're a brilliant yes. starter and you oh, get yeah, things going. Yeah. And, but you are brilliant people that love doing the work and, they, and, and you recruit to people is what they yeah. love doing and give them the job that they like yeah. if they're a middler or a finisher or, or love the detail or love the creation i love that about the way that you run your business is you put people in their um ec expertise and their motivation and their growth rather yes. than just their skill yeah so what what yeah i think um i mean as you said i'm a really good start i get about a Two thirds of the way through, and then I am beyond bored. I have to say, um, and it depends what it is. Obviously, if it's a piece of client work, you crack on and you, yeah. you get it finished. And normally, something interesting will happen at that point. Yes. Um, if it's casework, for example, so like legals might get involved. Um, but if it's if it's an internal project, then um, Ange is literally the most amazing person. Her her skill set is to take everything that I want and I envisage in my head and then make it reality. Mm. Um, Jane, who left us um, earlier in the year, we recruited her specifically because we are all in the team very people people, mm. um, but we're not massively ticking. We've done this and and driving a project forward with every single step that needs to happen whereas Jane coming from a completely different background to the rest of us was awesome at that and so drove some amazing projects both for clients but also for HR180 forward. Um, Sam is great at A being super competitive and wanting to win new business all the time um, and but then also holding people to account like I'm really very hands on or I'm very hands off. I don't seem to be able to find a great yeah. middle ground. Yeah. Um, I'm either all in, you ask for my opinion and you know you're going to absolutely yes. get it. Yeah, and there's gonna be red pen everywhere. Yeah. Or you're like, no, I can handle this and I'm more than happy to be either. I just can't kind of sit in that middle bit. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Sam's really good at being in that middle bit. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have a good, skill set and there's a good number of people around us and we build roles around people and where they want to move um you can't do that for absolutely everybody obviously yeah. but um i mean where can has, we do where we can we do where and we're we're that flexible in everything it's not just in what people want to be doing for their careers it's also in their hours and what their priorities mm. are for them either at home or you know at, outside activities as well so we do try to stay really flexible to keep the team together mm. and we have we've got a really amazing really wow. really amazing consistent great team you know we've got an average service level of seven years we've got Anne John um coming up to 13 yeah, so Isabel's on 15 we've got Anne and Laura on 13 um Miranda five Sam three so yeah we've yeah. got and um, what sort of companies do you work with? What sort of size or what sort of need do they have so that people can imagine it? What this amazing team does for you, for them? So it's any, any size business, really, but one where they want us to be both strategic and tactical. Yes. So it is about having... Um, it's not just, I guess I should say, do it the other way around. It's not just about delivering administration. Yeah. It's not just about delivering advice yeah. and you ringing us and saying you have a problem. Yeah. It is about us meeting with you every quarter, looking at what's changing in the business. Is it a merger or an acquisition? Is it growth? Is it you need five more developers because you just want a big contract? Looking at what are the things that you need having a people plan from the very outset of building a relationship and a partnership between our organisations mm -hmm. um, and then implementing that people plan. So that might be engagement. Um, it might be, and proper engagement, not just a survey. Mm -hmm. I mean, like actually engaging with everybody. It might be having a wellness and content plan. It might be you need a lot of recruitment and what does that look like and building your employer branding. Mm -hmm. So what are we going to deliver strategically in, in bigger projects, meatier projects? that are going to add value to your people mm. and are not necessarily transactional, mm. but alongside the transactional stuff. Mm. So making sure that an offer letter goes out and that somebody's maternity is dealt with and that we keep in contact with that person while they're on maternity mm. and make sure that if they want to use keeping in touch days, they can. 
Um, and then also, obviously, grievances might pop up or disciplinaries or um, managers just uncertain about how to handle somebody who's got long-term sickness, mm. for example. Um, and so we're there, we're actually holding and delivering the meetings. Mm. So clients, as anybody that genuinely just cares mm. about their people and wants them to have the best experience of work, um, and in order to get the most, obviously, out of that individual. So um, I know we were talking earlier that it, it starts with you understanding their business and their business plan, and yeah. not just the plan, but their mission and vision because yes. you're creating or supporting them creating this beautiful courageous machine that's going to get them there mm -hmm. and keeping it maintained so that um, the wheels don't fall off they don't they're not constantly replacing staff that are tired unhappy or, mi or missing something that you get the long service you get the people that are being supported they're getting the growth opportunities that people are on board with where they're going, that the business is going. So it's yeah. it's it's a really it really is partnership. Yes. You know, and um, we are part of their business. Like everything we do is bespoke to that client, yeah. they're down to their letterhead, yeah. their wording. So some clients it's still very formal. So we still have some legal clients, for example. So then it does talk about the company, the employee, mm -hmm. we expect you to be at such and such. You know, it's just it's a bit more formal language. Mm -hmm. And then, but we also conversely work with a social media company or a PR company, for example, where it's like, yay, congratulations, you got a job. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're really delighted to have you in the team. And ev so every single thing that leaves our building is, e as we are as invested in every single client as we are invested in ourselves. Yeah. And we want to sound and feel exactly like that client at that moment in time. Yeah. So yeah, it's for the HR business partners and the, the HR professionals in HR and AD, very different to an internal job. Mm. Um, and so there's obviously a period of training and adjustment and getting used to it and having to remember that everybody's got slightly different ways of doing things. Mm. And, um, and so I'm guessing to an employee that's working for a company that has outsourced their HR to you, when they speak to you or Sam or Laura or uh, uh, Invisible, Isabel, <laughs> yeah. Love that. Um, they, they they feel like they're talking to their own HR oh, person. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. not like, all right, well, I'm, I'm it's it's it is connected and yes. with that company's tone of voice, with that Absolutely. company's culture, um, with that company's vision in mind. Yeah. Um, as though you are in the office Absolutely. of that company. Of that company with that is that different to other HR companies? Um, um I I know you can't I speak think, for all yeah, of them. Yeah, but I, I do would feel imagine it is. so. I would imagine so, because we are both strategic. Lots of HR companies are either advice lines, um, and all they do is, you know, the manager rings. I've got an issue, and they respond to it, um, or they are tactical and, and operational. So again, we'll put in a policy document. You know, we'll. Uh, we might might do some training maybe on on some managers or something like that but mainly reactionary there is something happening you ring me and i will help you to solve it whether that's just i'll provide you with advice or i'll be a spare pair of hands whereas um we are part an actual function you know you have your hr business partner that is regularly meeting with the either the board or the senior executive team to look at, as I said, what is the, the strategy for the next quarter? Where are we going? What have we got time to, to be able to deliver? You have an HR advisor who is doing all of the, the operational side of it and the, the things that people do now. But yeah, the employees actually ring. It's not just managers. We, As soon as we onboard a new client, we have already been on site. That's part of our new mm. partnership process. Going on site tells us a lot about this company and, and how, and you can how we can them. support yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's so important because they won't know how what you see with fresh eyes that would be helpful for them for you to support yeah. them even more yeah. um, closely. Yes. Without being imposing. 
Y- yes, absolutely, without being imposing. But it is quite fascinating. We, um, I remember a client, we went on site, we walked into the building, the, uh, we were huddled in this little reception area initially, um, the paint was falling off the walls, it was filled to the rafters with old newspapers and magazines, kind of stacked around everybody, we weren't offered a drink. Uh, we walked through, we went up some old rickety stairs, um, where there was just this, you couldn't get up the stairs for stuff. There was stuff just absolutely everywhere. We were taken into a boardroom again, where the whole table was littered and covered. We weren't offered a single drink. We weren't told anything, despite asking. We weren't really told much about the organisation, and that the organisation swore to us that they genuinely cared about their people. And yet, the experience that we had clearly told us. You know, especially if you're going for an interview, you, that is not the impression that you would have got. Yeah. Um, and so you learn a lot from going yeah. on site. And I think because we've got just, that less now. We've got so many blind spots in our own business that because we're so busy, we're, we're trying to do our best, we're trying to do as much as possible, we're grateful to have our jobs. And, um, and I think since COVID, a lot more has been accepted being done remotely and yeah. the value of going on site will benefit yeah. them oh beyond i mean sometimes it's beyond the transactional stuff that you can do the the planning stuff or the insightful stuff it can be that person may not feel that they could turn to somebody else and say oh, it's tough or i feel like this strategy that i've got ahead is a big mountain to climb and spending half an hour with you or one of the team they can feel like actually anything's possible and yeah. I really feel heard and 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 that you can understand their point of view because you've been in their their space you've been yeah. in their place yeah and you've been in their business so I think it's it can move people along much faster than yes cracking on and doing more work remotely yeah um, do you find that sometimes you might get people that um say Oh, I'm too busy to have a meeting, and then you turn up and have one thing. Oh God, I didn't know I needed that. You must uh, yeah. get that. Um, we, uh, we we're a bit like a confessional. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I'm going to confess all to my priest kind of thing. And I also think that that as particularly HR and AD people have talked to me, written yeah. on them, that doesn't come across on the screen, no. but it does in person. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have the most amazing clients. They do meet with us. Yeah. We we do say from the very outset, from the very first meeting. We are, we're not remote, we're not hands off, we're not just going to take your money and, and you know, hope you not, forget, and hope you forget, yeah, pretty like much. Like a gym. <laughs> I was like wondering the best membership. way of being able to yeah. say that, but yes, basically, yeah. you know, we're going to be proactive, we're here to drive something forward for you, you know, wh- whatever it is that your objectives are, we're going to drive we're it. Gonna we're going to be proactive. We're going to be very proactive, we're not just kind of pootling around in the background and you have no idea what we do, so our clients are, are really good at that. But initially, that's quite difficult to build. People are more resistant, um, and, and more people are ringing us now than would have done before COVID, um, saying, I just want a price, mm-hmm. and they're not normally our clients, yeah. to be fair. Yeah. Um, you know, because we... when you're working with you guys, it's like you, you're, getting, you're, getting you, you're getting your heart, your soul, yes. your expertise, your wisdom, um, and so those that do just want the price, yeah, we, we won't win. We won't win on that basis because no, yeah. that's not what we're about. No. We we won't win that business. So it's it's not worth that person's time, mm. you know, investing their time telling us what mm. what they would like from an HR because they're they're more than likely going to just want transactional or administrative, yes. and yeah. that's how they see the HR function. Yeah, but also going back to the being on site, mm. it is great for the client because we do everybody. Uh, contributes collaboratively to how HR180 functions and and what our own strategies Mm. are Um, and that means that everybody understands how the business works and what the balance is sometimes between something being commercial great we're going to bring some money in but also being principled yeah and principled wins out every time but they have to understand that in order to be able to obviously talk to to a business owner or or a board um, and convince them that they do genuinely know what it means to to be and to run a company and, and um, to have all those different conflicting at times priorities yeah. and, and needs. Um, but whilst we're on site, we also get the opportunity to see all the employees. 
Yeah. Which we you wouldn't do remotely yeah. if you just literally had. And then that meeting. builds up more trust. Of course it does. Yeah. It and we know every trust. employee. So when an employee wants to talk to us. Um, or does such so does ask for a Teams meeting? It's not kind of like an awkward. Well, the thing um, is, sorry to interrupt you yet again, but quite often HR is referred to fondly and humorously as the police or you're in trouble. Or, but when your team goes in and you go around and you're saying hello, I can imagine that people would, if they had a question or before something became a problem, feel they could run it by you. You can give them great advice or some wisdom or a question for them to think about. You're so much more approachable because they've seen you on site rather than somebody that's on the end of the telephone. Because I think people have a fear of using the phone. You know, there are so many people that have fear of using the phone, never, never mind ringing somebody that works on behalf of the company. So I'm imagining that so many things get squished before they become yep. a problem because you're accessible yes. and that can only happen if you've been seen yeah um and also i'm guessing that in those conversations that happen on site things are uh, more easily shared that perhaps wouldn't be an agenda point for on the screen there is a difference isn't there, there is, from yeah. having conversations with somebody on screen to meeting yeah. them in person but also just overhearing something you're on site and there's cake in the kitchen you're like oh where's the cake and they're like oh it's so and so's daughter's just been born or something and they go and you're like oh and you go and say hi congratulations i hear you've had a daughter what do they weigh you know so you've never get on teams would no, you no. have absolutely no clue and so then you you learn, just passively learn so much about the organisation, about the people who are in it, what what um, it, what they need, what they want, what they need, what's meaningful to them. Like how do you engage? How do you design an engagement strategy for lots of different businesses and lots of different industries and sectors when you don't actually understand? And as I said before, an engagement strategy is not just a survey. Yes. Um, unless you actually understand those people and what's important to yeah. them you know like are they all developers constantly being called four times a week by other recruiters offering them 15 grand Absolutely. more to go and work down the road yeah. and then how do you engage somebody like that yeah. and, and why would they stay if money is important to them and, mo and that's what motivates them you don't get that in um in just doing everything over teams you do need to see the people so mm. yeah our clients do benefit from that yeah because we we feel obviously we're not there all the time we can't be yeah. we wouldn't be cost effective otherwise yeah. for the for the client they have their own yeah, team source. exactly <laughs> exactly but there's a really good balance to be had yeah um and i think everybody slightly lost that balance maybe a, a bit after covid when things were done you know everybody expected everything to be done remotely but we very quickly went back to okay it's not life's not quite normal in 2021 for example not quite normal but as much as we can get out we will and then slowly over time obviously it's become more yeah normal. and now it seems i mean four years five years i know it's unbelievable but i think so many people want to work from home and yet they don't and so oh, yeah. what, what some, of, some of the people I've spoken to, friends even, they want to work from home because they want the independence and the freedom, but they don't like that they are disconnected, which has to go with it, mm -hmm. that they are missing out on the team spirit stuff. Yeah. Um, they're misunderstanding each other sometimes. They're misinterpreting each other. They're misreading an email. I mean, my emails are terrible. <laughs> Whoa. So my <laughs> my wonderful Text messages are wow. My, they are <laughs> terrible. My wonderful web developer sent me a message saying, "Oh, I've not been in touch for a while, Lisa, and it's probably my fault." And he went through. He told me something personal at the beginning about himself, and then went on to uh, some of the things he was doing for me. And I just replied bluntly to the key things he wrote, and then I had to send another email <laughs> saying, "By the way, I hope you're well." <laughs> you know, so. But yeah, I thought when I read it, I thought, oh God, I love him. And then, but never, you would never know that by my message. And if he was to read too much into it, you'd think, oh, do you know what? She doesn't care about me. Yeah. And so we can really easily misinterpret things because we're not seeing the whites of somebody's eyes. Or, or and we were saying earlier, um, when we were chatting, weren't we, about the, the value of, uh, what's that, osmosis learning? Yeah. Is that, passive, I think, the right yeah, word? Osmosis, yeah, right. right. It just kind of sinks in passively. Yeah. 
We were just saying about, you know, the how I, when I was employed, and now I'm completely unemployable, uh, <laughs> free spirit, um, I learned so much by watching and listening to how other people did things that I didn't have to ask, can you show me? Mm, mm. Because I watched, learned, modelled yeah. it. Yeah. And when you're working remotely at home, you don't get that opportunity nope. to absorb other people's energy, to bounce ideas off people you are completely by yourself working stuff out for yourself and and i know so many people that have got themselves into a stew um in more ways than one over um, thinking they should know something so they didn't want to ask they don't want to burden their boss the boss is already busy but they think if i say i don't know this then i shouldn't have the job i've got mm. my job will become under threat and then it's taken them into becoming more and more and more reclusive and also hindered their uh, mental well-being mm -hmm. because it then it's turned internal on them mm -hmm. and there's so much of that going on for people that will never put their hand up and say yes that's me mm -hmm. and and yet they're and then they start looking for new jobs yeah because they want to get out of the funk that they're in and so they think i need to go somewhere else instead of readdressing it i don't know whether you've experienced any of that yeah no i yes absolutely i think um i think it, it's a difficult it's a really difficult balance uh, we have had um there's a, a lot in the news particularly in america but but here as well return to work mandates as the americans would call them and I had an experience uh, last week where I was talking to somebody who had to be in the office three days a week minimum. But when they're in the office, they don't have their they don't have the right equipment around them. They um, they haven't got the right licenses. Their boss didn't talk to them for the whole week, apart from the very first day. It was their first day, and spoke to them on the first day, but didn't talk to them for the rest of the week. Why would you go into that office yeah. environment? You would be like, well, I'll just work from home. Yeah. So I think the, whilst I get that the people want flexibility and maybe think that they're happier at home, mm -hmm. I think at the same time, the office has to offer something that is not quite, yeah, yeah. quite different and unique to literally just turning up and being present for eight hours a day. It has to do better, has to do more it's, than it's that. It's uh, Nikki Pattinson who does, she consults to retail and helps people, yes. helps businesses grow. Yeah, she, she just says, I can completely understand having gone into some shops why people are buying online, online. because they're not being yeah. served. People yeah. are not buying, they're not being sold to, they're not being helped no. and served. And I think as a leader, I saw a, a brilliant little, it was a little snippet and I put it on LinkedIn about uh, leadership being about you need to meet up with every one of your reports once a week. And if somebody says, well, I don't have time for that, then he says, you don't have time to be a leader. leader. Or you have too many reports. But if you're not yeah. meeting up with your people and um, removing the blocks, um, inspiring them, make, listening to them, uh, making them feel heard, seen, valued, appreciated, recognised, mm -hmm. uh, you're not leading. No. We, had, um, we had a new client join us about four months ago now. They had 19 direct reports. Oh, yeah. And what we would you say, <laughs> since we're on the subjects, what would you say is, is a, uh, a sweet spot for number of reports? I mean, it depends on the level, doesn't it? I suppose it, it depends on how operational they are. Yeah, as a, it does. As a it did very much de does depend on the level. If you were, I don't know, head of customer services, for example, then you'd probably have more. Um, if and it, you know, it depends on the size of the organisation as well. So if you're head of the customer services, but there's four customer services teams, then four because yes. you'll be head a team leader of each of those. Yeah. Um. So it does depend on the organisation. But this was a very very senior person with 19 direct reports and not physically possible. What's the and downside of that? No, nobody gets any time. Yeah. Nobody, nobody gets any time whatsoever, or so under, truly all... understands the mission, or feels yeah. truly understood by the by that individual, by the manager, um, and they muddle along literally as best they can with little to no guidance because they just see their manager, you know, crumbling basically. And, and that would be really tough for them, yeah. for the more proactive, solution orientated leaders that lead that report yeah. into that person is that. They're not getting time for their ideas to be heard. Yeah. 
to implement them so they so it dry so their ideas dry up i think there's yeah. no point because then, then i'm not going to get heard and if i get heard then i'm not going to get allowed to go ahead with it because it's going to need more time with them so it's a real limiter mm. isn't it yeah especially when that particular individual wants to sell in five years mm. but maybe have a saleable business because mm. <laughs> it relies solely all those 19 people rely solely on you <laughs> um so yeah it's quite fascinating really but this is why it, we, we you can see an org chart can't you the client can send you an org chart and you can sit there and go all right that's what it looks like when you actually go and see and meet them meet everybody in, in practice and you're like wow yeah yeah or even sit in a meeting which I imagine would tell you a, a thousand yes a thousand things that yes. a plan won't tell you sitting in one meeting for one hour you're yeah. probably seeing that who needs to speak less who needs to speak more who's been suppressed um, yeah. all sorts of things even like how organized the meeting is you can probably see from one meeting where a company could do even better or needs to do more of what they're doing yeah. I have to say that terrifies me if somebody were to come into HR and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> one yeah. of my meetings, but I'm really good at doing it to other people. I could see you visualising that as I was Yeah, speaking. like, oh, <laughs> there would was... be so much room for improvement. I, I had no idea whether it was the fact that you didn't want to sit in somebody else's meeting, but it turned out that the expression on your face was fear of somebody I don't want sitting them in mine. <laughs> it would but be... you can't see what you what you can't see what you can't see yes is that the expression yeah. you you think you're doing a great job obviously yeah but you do rely and i have to say i'm the ho one eighty team are very good at telling me when i'm going wrong and <laughs> um, particularly some of the long-standing members of team who no longer go red when they talk to me anymore <laughs> um but you know they the lots of people won't have a team that's confident in doing that but yeah. also won't have the opportunity to have an outside point of view and somebody mm. to go do you think what this this might be something you want to consider for next time or yeah. how about we look at this and how do we um upskill the team so that they're capable of being able to make their own decisions so yeah, yeah lots, yeah, lots yeah, of yeah, things yeah, all come out people don't know because we've become so, we have so many blind spots, don't we? Because yes. we are so busy. Yes, of course. And, yeah. um, and then um, there was something I was going to say. Um, I don't know what you don't know. What was the other thing I was going to say? It's, oh, yes, that saying, that belief of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. But not broken isn't a high performance. No. It doesn't mean Mindset, it's efficient, does it? It yeah. just means it's like it's limping along. But, then, <laughs> but so many people think, well, the meetings are all right. It's not broken, so let's not fix it. But actually, is it is it giving you all that you need to free you up to go and do what you need to do? And I think your fresh eyes coming in, in a, in a and you've got no agenda other than you want to give them massive value and also them be an amazing success. Mm. Um, yeah. So what one tip? Then let's do this for leaders. Uh, what would MDs of companies, particularly, what one tip would you give them that would help them sleep better at night? <laughs> Other than a large glass of brandy, well, yes, or, or, <laughs> or some medication, or a Horlicks. <laughs> Other than that, what do you think the key thing is first that it keeps most MDs awake at night? If there was one, and I haven't prepped you with this, so I apologise. No. But if there was um, one common thing, I think is it the no no I think it's growth. Mm. Um, obviously that comes through stuff, doesn't it? Really, but yeah, it it's about it will be about getting bigger and better and more efficient, um, and having shareholder value and all of those things. Um, but you can't do any of those without your people essentially yeah. but they'll be thinking they won't they won't necessarily be thinking about people in fact i think people will be at the very bottom of their list yeah. they'll be thinking about where can they get the next loan from or you know that um yeah. outstanding loan or mortgage for a building or capital capex expenditure for something mm. or um yeah they'll be bogged down by real what they think are real operational issues and challenges but behind all of that will be people and i don't think that they would necessarily have thought that mm. um 
that actually that is the most important thing. They don't have a business without those people. Mm. They can have all the equipment in the world, but if there's nobody to deliver it, no one to service it, nobody to show, train people how to use it, it's going to make no difference mm. at all whatsoever. So underpinning yeah. the thing that sleep that keeps them awake at night is if the teams were working at their optimum, mm. um, processes were at their best, people were motivated, uh, the right people were being recruited, the yeah. right people were being released so they could go and do the job they're meant to do in another company, yeah. um, the people were being supported in their times of difficulty, would ultimately have a compound effect oh, absolutely. On, of course. on the cash flow yeah. and on the uh, revenue income and on the, yeah. yeah. It would, but it is not taken, the compound effect is not seen yeah. and it is always... Almost exactly like, what's in front of you right yeah, now. Firefighting. Fire, <laughs> yeah, firefighting. Fighting. And but not just firefighting. Like it's much easier to look and say, oh well, we've just won three pieces of business, and we now need, I don't know, a, a big piece of equipment or you know whatever. It's much easier to see that, isn't it, yeah. rather than to see we need to re-engage our people yeah. and we need them to be at optimum performance. To it's really drill down to the root cause yeah. and, and not to have any blame but to have more how do we enhance what we've got rather yeah. than because it might not need fixing it just needs enhancing doesn't yeah. it and yeah i think there's uh, unfortunately what we're seeing in the market at the moment when we're networking and, and talking to people is that there is a, a real concern over what is happening in the economy what is the employment legislation going to be like what is tax and the at implications and those kinds of things what's going to be coming up so it seems like it's a very uncertain future which means that people are putting off decision making mm. um and then that's also but that's also having an impact on their people because they're not seeing a future plan as everyone's like ah don't know what to do it, we've got um a, a, a client that at the moment their board not them specifically but their board has put a multi-million pound project on hold to kind of see what's going to happen but then that means the whole company is thinking well does that mean we're in trouble yeah, <laughs> yeah. should we be worried should we be looking for jobs somewhere else so it, ha it has such a massive impact mm. Um, so I think there's a little bit of uncertainty and that would be keeping people awake at the minute like and, start and do people leave do, do staff leave when they feel uncertain uncertain is such I feel like it's such a horrible space to be in there's uncertainty yeah. isn't it yes I think um, in my experience and this is only my experience so it, it could be very different elsewhere um, you're really good strong people who have uh, initiative and the, you know take on responsibility, have autonomy, they, but through uncertainty, start to think to themselves, you know, they can see what might happen, don't want to take that risk and they look. And some of the people that are just happy to take instructions and we need all types of people in a business, absolutely, but your high performance individuals are going to be quite concerned by levels of anxiety and yes potentially look elsewhere mm. um and then um you know for other people it will take a long time before that filters down but they're not necessarily your high performance people mm. it, it does depend because sometimes you have really high performing people who do see it but also are incredibly loyal yes you know yeah. so would give you the benefit of the doubt for a period of time mm. So it does depend on the culture of the business and the levels of communication in the business before people decide what they want to do. With and there's a difference around. between being open and transparent, isn't there? Yes. You, you, your teams don't need you to be transparent, but they probably need a, de a, a degree of openness. Yeah. Uh, I do want to ask this last question, which is, um, in your experience in today's market, are uh, great employees... Be, uh, being headhunted so I know it always happens but now more than ever is there a, an appetite in the market that um, great people are being um, hunted yeah. and so there's a, a real demand on how you retain your great people even if as you said earlier somebody's offering them 15 grand more yeah 
I um, I think there's more fluidity in the market definitely at the minute for, for candidates that we haven't been seeing. Um, and so there's more movement and more candidates available um, that just they just they just weren't everybody was holding still everybody was worried about maybe being made redundant and if they join a new company obviously having no um benefits at all and and if you know so that so they've not been people have not been moving around as much and that's increasing um in terms of and do you know i've totally forgotten the question <laughs> and, uh, well i think i asked it in quite a woolly way but it's our uh... Our our great yeah, yeah, our great candidates, few and far between now, and, and also in high demand, not just because of scarcity, but because, um, because, yeah, I the needs are there. I think that there are awesome candidates everywhere, but what is not happening is that businesses still, and this is one of my bugbears after 18 years of saying, come on now, people, sort it out. Um, businesses are not still not saying, this is who we are, this is what we, and I'm not building a proper employer brand. So you've got the big guys, yes, and but then you've also got the dichotomy of, well, they have a brand, but is that actually how it is on the ground? Mm. Um, and smaller organisations are not building that. They're not building an em their employer brand and matching that and that being the um, experience of candidates coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and so then they're not necessarily attracting the talented people that are out there. They're not finding them. They're not interviewing them in, in the right way. Um, they are not having candidates who self-select. So they might be having thousands of applications, but fairly average people that actually don't have either the skill set or don't have the um, initiative or proactiveness that they would be looking for um, or they're having none <laughs> because of the way that they're they're setting out their advertising and and the way that they are um, trying to you know just talking to an agent for example but that agent isn't selling them the best way well has the agent actually been in and seen the site mm -hmm. have you have you told them who you are and what you're looking for does is there a candidate pack you know how are you how are you actually selling yourself to to the candidates um and then the there is a there is a wealth of good candidates out there but they are also candidates are just scattergunning still you know it's 100 applications um the cv isn't bespoke the the letter isn't bespoke most of the time there isn't even those things anymore it's literally just upload what you've already got in LinkedIn or Read or you know one one of those uh, kind of like a job portal, um, and it's not the candidates are not necessarily thinking what do I want who do I want to work for what kind of work do I want to be involved with and then only approaching those companies mm. so it's kind of from both sides everybody's take all the different multicoloured beads out there and pull them through a funnel and see what pops out the other mm. end rather than going, I only want red ones. Mm. Is that something that you do at HR 180s, help somebody with their recruitment strategy? So they're recruiting yes. exactly the right profile, exactly the right attitude, the right skill set for that culture and for yeah. that job. Yes, absolutely. And still, people are traditional interviewing, i.e. look at a CV, tell me about what you've done. Well, it's a little bit like being in a police station, allegedly, never <laughs> been in one, where somebody's like, looking for the, prove to me that you are this in, yeah. in your CV. Or it's, it's, it's very, um, I did, um, I wrote a, an amazing um, I've done it a few times for companies, but recruitment process and way of recruiting people that is absolutely congruent with the way the culture, mm. the outcomes that the business wants and the teams that are already in place. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, but it's you have to change how you're currently doing yeah. it in order to get and attract the people that want to work in you. So the recruitment process has to be the gluing process, I think, where... Yeah. Where it's not just, you know, me as the employer, I get to decide who I'm having. It's actually, 
I need to prove. I need to show them who we are so they know what they're getting into. So we attract the people that want to get into this yeah. and also that we um, sell ourselves in such a way that they want to get in with us as well. So it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's everything. a big thing. There's two things. The, um, that stickiness, mm. the, um, the, the candidate has to, to want, more candidates now than ever, want to work with a company that has a specific set of values and a specific way of doing business. And not every company has values or has values that are embedded. Yeah. There's a very big difference still between we've got three three words on the website, four words on the website, but they're not expanded anywhere. They're literally just words. But then they're also not embedded. And that culture is not um, is not being explained anywhere. So that's, that's the first thing. You can't be sticky to those candidates if you haven't got those things to explain you what they are. And then also embedding, having the recruitment is great, but it's no good if that then isn't linked to everything else in the organisation. Yes. So if you're recruiting a certain set of people on the basis of their behaviours, rather than just literally skills, because we can teach them skills, we want to know about them and their personality and whether they're going to accept feedback really well, whether yeah. they're going to be proactive and positive people yeah. in adversity, those kinds of things are the things we want, actually want to get to the bottom yeah. of. Um, there's no point recruiting those people into your organisation going, yay, and nothing. Yeah. You know, they need to be onboarded, they need properly, they need to understand exactly what their responsibilities are, they need training, they need to understand what the different parts of the organisation do. It's not just, uh, oh, this is Gary from accounts and Matt's job. There's your seat. And, yeah, and there's your seat, pretty there's much. Yeah, and and you've got no equipment because yeah. we forgot to order it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, what how you know how are people being promoted is that also linked to those same things to your culture to your values to the behaviors that you want demonstrated are, are your leaders are you holding them to account because actually sometimes it's too difficult to hold your leaders to account and so you don't um but then if your leaders can't even live your values then why on earth would anyone yeah. else bother and then so it becomes it becomes a, a point of resentment as well yeah um, unenforced and unlived values that yeah. end up being a marketing exercise that yes. looks good to customers oh, yeah. um, and, wor and like you say words on a wall don't say anything a word on the wall is open to massive interpretation it has to have a statement in it of who you're being when you're honoring that value what it looks like so that we can um, you're so right um darling hey, it's been fun it has been fun anyway. i hope i've pressed record is all i can say right now <laughs> So do I. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Claire Morley Jones of hr180.co.uk. .co .co .uk. <laughs> um, which will be in the description portion of this uh, podcast and video. And um, I think we need to get you back on for Meant for More Values. Ooh, yes. yes. Because I think that companies Ooh. can often be meant for more if they put their values in place. Yes. That helps their team be part of something, proud to be part of something, yep. operate and behave in a certain way that they're proud to, that enhances productivity, team spirit, solutions. Oh, yeah. Well, I think oh. that's, that's it done. We've just yeah. done it. <laughs> We've just done it. The mental really values. <laughs> more for, yeah. Let's do that. I can that. add a lot more to that, actually, in mm -hmm. terms of um, rituals, for example. Yeah. How are your values lived out in the rituals of your organisation? Oh. Oh, yes, yes. Right, yeah. we're going to book a date in the diary. Stand by. <laughs> Claire Molly Jones, part two of ten. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's a big commitment. <laughs> oh, thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you on the next podcast.